Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. This happened back in 2010 when I was 21. My best friend and I had blown off any sort of responsibility for a whole summer and chose just to party instead. It's probably no surprise that by the end of the summer, we were both evicted. We were roommates, and now we were condemned to our parents' houses until we got our shit together again. One night, we were at my mom's place playing Left 4 Dead until about 2 a.m. when Cam decided to call a cab and then head back to his mom's place. He had to use my phone to call the cab company because he forgot to pay his bill. Yes, I know. We were real winners at this point in our lives. This was also the days before Uber and Lyft, so you'd have to call the station and they'd send for a car over their CP thing. About 15 minutes later, we could see the cab waiting outside and he got in and left. 10 minutes later, I got a call on my cell phone from the cab company. I knew the number by heart, so I knew it was coming from the central station. And when I answered, there was a woman on the line whose voice immediately sent shivers throughout my body. This is Badger Cab calling for Cameron. His cab has arrived. I was confused and responded with something like, Uh, huh? She said, Tell Cameron to come outside, please. The voice was echoey and distant, like it was an auditory house of mirrors bouncing around a fog-drenched void. I wasn't sure why the voice was creeping me out so much, so I tried pushing it aside and just told her that he already left like 10 minutes ago. I glanced outside the window and saw a car idling outside on the street. It was parked a bit to the right of my house, so all I could see were the brake lights. I figured dispatch probably sent an extra cabbie on accident. I told her that I was sorry. But there must have been a mix-up, because he already left. But the woman responded almost like she didn't hear me the first time. Tell him to come outside. She repeated, but this time with a rigid bite in her tone. He was already picked up, I repeated. There were a few weird noises for a second, like wind was blowing into the microphone. Then, the call dropped. I redialed the number to the cab company, and a man answered. I told him what had just happened, leaving out the creepiness of the voice, and let him know that they must have sent two cabs on accident. I don't have any female cab drivers out tonight, the dispatcher told me. I thought to myself, maybe it was a guy with a high-pitched voice. He told me, that the driver picked up my friend just fine a while ago, and that a cab driver wouldn't call through their landline like that anyways. When I told him there was a car idling outside and reiterated that there was 100% a woman calling and telling my friend to come outside and get in her car, he started getting very creeped out and worried. We both figured that someone must have had spoofed the cab company's phone number, it's actually pretty easy to do, but that didn't leave us with any comfort. Why was someone spoofing a cab company's phone number and waiting outside their customer's pickup location? How did she even know that Cameron had called for a cab? I hadn't talked to anyone, and Cam didn't have a phone. The dispatcher radioed his driver and made sure he had Cameron and that everything was fine. Then, let me know that he was safe and almost to his destination. The dispatcher and I talked on the phone for a couple minutes, brainstorming what the hell could possibly be happening. And from his perspective, it's almost like someone is following and trying to lure a customer in their car, which is probably not good for business. 
After Cam made it to his mom's crib, he called me on the landline there to ask what was going on. And the only logical explanation he could think of was that it was this stalker that he's been dealing with for several years. He had a restraining order on her because she would follow him, break into his apartment, and wait for him to come home. I would do all sorts of weird, creepy shit like that. I'm not totally convinced that's what was happening though. How would she have known that he had just called for a cab on my phone? How would she have known where my mom lives? If he were leaving my actual place, or the place of one of our close friends, then that would be plausible. But we were pretty tucked away on the outskirts of town in a suburb, and my mom has a different last name than I do, so she couldn't have googled it. But it's the most logical explanation either of us could come up with. So, it's the one that I'm betting on, until someone throws out a better theory. This story goes way back to 1998, when I was 16 years old. I was with my two other friends, who I will call Ben and Jake for privacy reasons. So, it was a late summer evening on a Saturday, and I was sitting in my room listening to some 80s rock, as teenagers back then would do. I got bored, and after some time, I went outside to meet Ben and Jake. We were chilling in Ben's garage for a while, and drinking beer and smoking some pot. We got bored pretty quickly, and went out to do some teenage shit. I remember we were walking down this narrow path by the woods, and down towards a lake. Back in the late 90s, there was a popular hangout spot for teenagers there. So we were hoping for seeing some other kids there. But when we arrived, there was no one there except the sound of crickets out in the tall grass. We sat for a while on the bench and just talked for about 15 minutes. When Jake wanted to go to an old fishing hut by the lake, we all agreed on going inside and exploring it. We then entered the hut. While Jake and Ben were walking around and breaking shit, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. We went upstairs where there was an old wooden boat lying there with a fishing net over it. We were kind of checking it out when all of a sudden, we heard the wooden door to the hut creak open. We could hear heavy footsteps entering down below, followed by heavy breathing, and we all stopped dead in our tracks and almost held our breath. There was a round of five second break that felt like an eternity when suddenly, a man spoke in a drunken voice. <laughs> I know you're there. <laughs> come out, come out, wherever you are, you little brats. The heavy footsteps started to walk towards the stairs as the old floor creaked underneath. Jake went inside the wooden boat and the rest of us followed, and we put the fishing net over our heads and didn't move. The man arrived upstairs and we could hear him stumbling around. I can hear you. We were sitting dead still, but I could feel the fear in all of us. The man was walking around and moving stuff. I was thinking of a plan to escape without being caught, but we literally were like sitting ducks. Suddenly, we could feel the fishing net being ripped off. Here you are. Jake reacted the fastest and pushed him away, so the man fell onto his back, and we all ran like hell out of there and threw the tall grass into the woods. We could hear the man give a chase, but then he gave up, probably due to his drunken state. We all went back to Ben's garage and fell onto the couch out of exhaustion. Jake then told us that the man dropped a knife when he fell on the floor and we all sat there in shock for the rest of the night. So to this day, I can't help myself but wonder, what would have happened if Jake didn't push the man? Mm -hmm. 
This happened to me during the summer of 2017. I'm a girl, and I was 19 during the events. I am going to stay vague regarding the details, the country where it happened, the origins of the people, and the name of the places, because I don't want to be recognized or cause bad reputation to any community. It is not really scary, but it's still creepy, and at the end of the story is so crazy that I still can't believe it to this day. I was living in an apartment with my family. On the parking lot, there were always several guys repairing cars. I used to come back home pretty late, and often, I see these guys just talking and sometimes saying good evening to me. And at one time I got as a joke, We kept you a spot. But nothing really inappropriate, and I would just answer politely. I had noticed that one of them had a tuned up sedan and must be living in the same building as me, but a different entrance because in the morning, the car was parked there. It was a really recognizable car. And one morning, as I was going to my work, I realized that this car is parked next to mine. Well, he doesn't live far, so it's not that weird. But when I started to sit in my car, I realized that the owner is actually sitting in his car and looking at me, smiling. Well, okay, it's 8.30 a.m., so why not? I start to drive to get to my work, and I'm in this special roundabout where you have to stop inside if a car on the right is coming, which is the case, so I stopped. I'm looking on the right to see when I can go, and realize that in the second lane, the car is there, and as soon as I take the road for work, he's just right behind me. Even when we get real close, he is still there. I was working in a mall with the biggest hypermarket of the neighborhood, so I thought maybe he was going for groceries. And I get in the underground parking lot and park. He does the same and right next to me. I chose to ignore him and go for the escalator. Well, guess what he does? He does the same thing and starts to talk to me. Hello, I'm Steve, and you? I'm Anna. How old are you? I'm 19. I'm 27. Is that a problem? Uh, no. Okay, so you work here? Yes. Okay, well, see you tonight. Bye. So at this moment, I realized that he was not speaking the language well. I answered the questions because he didn't seem scary. And well, I really didn't want to make a scene. When he said bye, I thought, yeah, I see him every night in my parking lot with his friends, so it's normal. But when I finished work, the exact same thing in the morning happened, and while I sat in my car, I realized the guy was right next to me. Since I was surprised and he seemed really eager to talk to me, I got out and was like, What are you doing here? I have something for you. Then he smiles really big. What? No! And he gave me a red rose. Embarrassed and shocked, I refused it a couple of times, but he kept on insisting. And I knew the only way that I would get rid of him would be to accept it, which I did, and then he left. I kept the flower in my car so my family didn't realize that something is happening, and I threw it in the trash can outside later. So this was the beginning of the week, and he started to wait for me after work to give me drinks, or to ask me out for cinema or to a restaurant. And I refused everything, but ended up accepting the drinks to make him leave. In the weekend, I had a second job, and I had these late shifts in a fast food. It was my first shift there since everything happened, and I was closing the restaurant with three other colleagues. Since it's pretty dark and late, there was a rule that one of us 
had to leave first and drive around the restaurant to make sure that it was safe for everyone. I wouldn't do that normally, but this night, I had a really weird feeling that he might be there. So I volunteered for the drive. And well, right on the spot, he was parked next to my car. It was 1 a.m., so how long was he waiting for? I told him to go a bit further, otherwise... We can't leave, which he did. After my colleagues left, I stopped next to his car and opened the window just to explain to him why I reacted like that. And before I knew it, he opened his car door and got into my car. I just want to remind you that this man knew where I worked, where I lived, what my car looked like and who my family was, and it was a neighbor. And that's why I never wanted to make a scene. But at this very moment, I was scared for my life. A 27-year-old muscular guy that I didn't know was in my car at 1 a.m. in an empty parking lot. He seemed talkative and I didn't have any other choice. So I decided to listen to him and learn stuff about him too. He said that he arrived in the country in 2014 at the capital. He stayed there two years, and in 2017, he got in our neighborhood. I did the math and realized that a year was missing. I asked about it, and he answered, I was in jail. Why were you in jail? Well, I didn't have papers, and I made a car accident. Okay. It wasn't that scary in the end, which reassured me, and the guy said goodnight and then he left. There were many times where I checked the inside mirror and would see that he was right behind me. I wouldn't know since when, and even to this day, I check really often to know if a car is following me. Once, I was washing the dishes during a late shift. I had my phone and I was texting friends which were two guys, to let them know when I was finishing so that we could meet. And when I was working, I had to leave my phone. And maybe half an hour later, a colleague comes to me and says, Hey, your friend ordered at the drive through and asked for you. Oh, yes, I told him that I wanted to meet later. I then took my phone and said, So you came by? Were you alone? What are you talking about? And at this moment I knew. I rushed to my colleague and asked her to describe the guy and the car. And well, it was Steve. There were so many cases of things like that happening. He followed me to my friends, threatened to reveal stuff about a friend to his dad that he knew. Also, one of his friends, Carl, who I spotted on my parking lot, had followed me a couple of times too. A friend who knew who Carl was told me that he was married, he had kids, and was like 40, and I was so shocked. One evening, around 10 p.m., I parked and saw a friend or neighbor getting home. It's been a while since we talk, so he said he'll be back in two so we can chat. And while waiting, I'm getting my stuff in the trunk. This is when the car parked behind me, it flashes its lights at me, and I didn't have to turn around to guess who it was. I had been patient, since nothing too crazy had happened, and I didn't want to scare or create problems to my family. But this night, I was pretty pissed off, and it was happening right next to my place. I threw my stuff and I rushed at the car. Both Steve and Carl were there, and I told them to leave me and to stop following me. Steve didn't say a word, and Carl just smiled and said goodnight, and I didn't answer and left. And well, it worked, because they didn't bother me for months. Steve changed his car and now had a black one, which was still a really recognizable car. He followed me a few more times, and one day, he tried to talk to me with a friend that could translate well what he said. Again, Steve didn't really spoke the language well. I explained well to his friend that I wasn't interested and it was the last time that I talked to him. However, 
Months later, I see in my neighborhood this kid that I knew from sports, and I knew he lived in an apartment at about the same place as Steve. The whole thing was over, but it was always in the back of my head. I didn't really know who the guy was, and didn't know if this would start again. So I was curious, and you know how curiosity is a bad thing. I started to talk to him. I was like, Hey, do you know the guy that lives in your building? I describe a physical trait of Steve to him. Oh, yeah, this guy. And he also gives a description. I answer, No, no, the guy who owns a black car. Oh, you mean my dad? I froze. I have no idea how this conversation ended, since it's still a big shock even to this day. I know, I didn't tell him anything about his dad's behavior though. I knew this kid for so many years, and he was actually the son of this guy. And he had three or four brothers and sisters. Then I realized the guy had totally lied about his age because the kid was like 15, and I believed him like an idiot. But this is not the end of the stunning discoveries. A few days later, I met a friend who knows about these events and tell her that the kid, that she knows too, is his son. She looked at me so shocked and she said, All this time, it was this guy? What? You know him? He left his country because he stole money from powerful people and then he joined his family here, but he got in jail for suspicion of terrorism. What? And I remember that when he followed me, he would actually stop when I would drive in the direction of the police station. I just thought it was because he still had issues with his papers. She kept talking and showed me a video. This is his wife here, and the second woman is his second wife. She was so tired of him talking to other girls that she went to their country to find a second wife. I just want to be precise here that my friend was coming from the same country as this guy, but she was born here, and that's why she had this kind of information. It's a small community, so they kind of all know each other. I was very lucky that nothing happened to me, and I still can't believe it, and I wonder how it could have gone if I acted differently. So this was three years ago, right before the pandemic hit, and it's now one of my favorite stories to tell, now that I'm no longer scared and I've moved a thousand miles away and a few years' time has passed. So my husband was in the military during this time, and I was a housewife, due to work being hard for me to get in the area that I was in, as I can't drive and live off base. Well, any military person knows military schedule is pretty darn predictable, and much of our lives ran on an easy-to-memorize schedule, and to make matters worse, my husband was often gone for long hours. For about two to three months, I'd been seeing this guy wandering around my home and peeking in windows. Honestly, I didn't originally think much of it beyond being weirded out. We didn't have anything that would interest a robber. No TV, a single seven-year-old computer, a broken couch and a table, and a mattress on the floor. Literally nothing expensive in our home beyond a gun that was locked up in a safe that may have looked like it had stuff. But that's a lot of work for what looks like a home of people living in poverty. So I didn't think anything of it. Yet, he kept coming back when my husband was gone. I'd see him every few days or hear him due to my normally super sweet cat at that time hating him, hissing and yowling when he saw him so I know that he was there when I hear my cat making an angry fuss. Well, one day, I went out with my husband 
and I guess I didn't lock the door or something properly, as our lock would be a bit funny and I was running late. According to our normal schedule, I'd have gone to base with my husband for family mandatory fun, and I'd have to come back home alone in an Uber, while my husband stayed on base to work or hang with his friends. What ended up happening was I fell sick with a migraine. I have hemiplegic migraine, so it can really be serious, and his sergeant told me to take me home and take care of me when he saw me. Now, before I go on, I should probably describe my old home. I lived in a two-bedroom apartment complex in the mountains. It was a massive complex. My home layout was this. My front door led to my kitchen and dining area, and my kitchen and dining area wall next to my door was another glass door. Think a patio door. And across from my kitchen was my room. Then... You go down the hall and hit the living room that has another glass door wall next to the fireplace. And finally after that, you go across the living room at the end of the hall and you hit our guest room, or my plant room, cat's playroom, or guest room, with yet another glass door wall. I was literally surrounded by giant glass doors. Then outside, we had a porch, and on the porch was a storage closet where I usually kept my bike as I couldn't drive due to my migraines and seizures. Now, back to the story now that I've set the scene. So when my husband brought me home again not per our normal schedule, we came home to find our door slightly ajar. We gave each other a look and went inside anyways, with me mumbling how I must have not locked properly due to us being in a rush that morning. We walked into the kitchen, where my husband immediately went to the fridge and started looking around for water for himself and me. He then spoke for the first time while in the fridge. Honestly, I don't remember what he even said. But then we heard something, maybe a few seconds after he spoke. Our porch glass door in the back of our home moved. We both knew the sound really well as I liked to sit on the porch reading for hours, so I was always coming in and out. He then grabbed my shoulder and whispered to grab his gun from our room, and he then grabbed a butcher's knife and went towards the living room. I went and grabbed the gun, noticing on my way into our room, our living room glass porch door was wide open. Upon giving my husband the gun and following behind him, as I dialed 911 in my panic, saying that I had an active break-in, while well, my husband did a sweep of our home, and while I was on the phone upon coming back down the hall towards the kitchen to see if he went around back up and to the front, as we lived on a literal mountain side, and one side was blocked off out back, we heard our storage door out back that we forgot to shut slam open. Me and my husband ran out back where I found our storage door swinging open and just barely saw the same guy who had been spying on me in our home. He didn't end up coming back that day. I also later found that only things missing were some of my clothes, lingerie, and bathroom care products. The police showed up four hours later and took a statement from me and my husband. Eventually, my husband had to return to his normal schedule. I was terrified and he didn't like it, but we had no choice till we could find a new place in three months when our contract ended. The first week things were fine, he didn't come back yet, and my cat didn't yell or throw any fits, so he didn't see him either, and things were fine that week. Then another week went by, I started to think maybe the gun we brought out scared him. Yeah, no. The third week, he ended up coming back while my husband was at work in the morning. He first tried the door and was trying to force it open, and then started banging on the glass next to the door. I put 911 on speaker and texted my husband while I panicked and cried. And while I was on the 911 call, he ended up leaving and giving up, and when I voiced that he walked away from the door, 
The 911 dispatcher lady spoke to me like I was being ridiculous for freaking out this badly over someone trying to get in my locked door. I hung up and finally called my husband while I had a full-on panic attack and it turns out that he was already coming home with a car full of his and my friends, also in the army, whom worked with him as they turned around towards me soon as I texted what was going on. He ended up going to the back door and trying both glass doors there as well, before finally giving up. And about four minutes later, my husband and his friends arrived and found me clutching my cat and crying. They ended up scanning the area and still didn't find him. The cops showed up seven hours later, and I, very angry this time, gave another report. I ended up with three of the guys sleeping over in the spare room, and my husband and me slept in our now locked and bolted bedroom. Then the next day, me and my husband friends went out and got an installed cameras in all our doors and window areas. After this last time, beyond him going back to looking into our windows three more times, I had never had another issue till I moved out shortly thereafter this, and since, I never saw him again. This happened last month. The area that I go to the gym in has good and bad parts. I am in the good part, but over the last month now, I'm not so sure anymore. I will also say that the area that I am in at the moment, we have had an issue with a guy who lives around the gym and likes to tailgate women and chase them in his car, and he seems to only do this when they are alone in the car. So, basically, I had a guy follow me when I was walking home at night, but as someone who used to volunteer at an AOD center, nothing really phases me, and I am rarely scared. So there is me walking home, and as I am walking home, or at least around the corner from the gym, some guy in his 50s and 60s starts following me, and so I go a different route, and I lose him. I come back to the gym a few days later, and this time much earlier, but the guy is back again, wandering around aimlessly drunk near the gym buying pizza next door. I am thinking, shit, okay. So he then afterwards decides to start looking into people's cars. I was thinking, hell, this guy might want to break into the cars. I am with a friend and at that time, I notice that he is looking at his car. I warned him and he leaves the gym and goes into his car. He then drives home and I notice that he isn't wanting to break into people's cars, but instead, something else. By that point, I am thinking that he wants to look for my car even though I walk to the gym. I am on the elliptical machine and I feel safe in the gym even though he is outside because no one can come into the gym unless you remember. Otherwise, the alarm goes off if you try to open the door. To get into the gym, you would need a key card. This would give you a better understanding on how I felt safe. I also had other people around me and I wasn't alone in the gym. So lo and behold, this guy looks at me through the glass window and I am facing the window. So he waves at me and writes down his name and number on a piece of paper and shoves it against the window that I am directly facing. I shake my head going no, and he leaves. I am thinking, this guy originally came from the pub nearby, as we do have a habit of dealing with drunk people from the pub. It doesn't help that there's a bottle shop nearby, in a kebab place, as well as the pizza place that I mentioned. I swear, my best guy friend lives in that suburb, and he keeps telling me how it's changing due to the number of halfway houses nearby. Honestly, my story is not too bad. 
though I would still rather never meet this person again. I was stalked but not because they were into me, but because they were into my best friend, Emma. Emma is gorgeous, like to the obscene level, and has always had guys and girls fawning over her, and she had a friend named Mike, and Mike is who this story is about. I met Mike through Emma and it was clear immediately that Mike was obsessed with her. She was actually into him for a bit, but she wanted something that's not serious. But Mike came on hard and heavy, so Emma distanced herself from him. And she distanced herself even more after he made some shocking comments about his opinion on sexual assaults mostly being fake. When Emma and I graduated high school, we had planned to move in together, but due to a family situation, she only stayed at our place about two days a week and never on a set schedule. She also could not keep a job to save her life. Her family life was chaotic and made it where she would have to leave at a moment's notice. Emma also had several places where she crashed at. Family, friends, my family, and it depended on her situation and any odd jobs that she was working. She did a lot of odd jobs, babysitting, yard work, elder care, catering, and etc. Nowhere stable, and often, she wouldn't know what she was doing until that day. After Emma distanced herself from Mike, I started to realize that he was at my work often, like three or so times a week. It would have not been too weird, except my work was a department store for women and children. No men's clothes at all in this store. At first, Mike would just come in, do a lap, and then leave. It was weird, but I honestly just thought that he was walking the mall. Lots of people do that, as my town is practically no entertainment. Then Mike started hanging out in my store and talking to me while I worked, always talking about Emma, how is Emma, why is she avoiding him, those kind of questions. I was evasive, giving one-word answers, trying to tell him that I needed to work. My manager even scolded me for having friends hanging out while working. And when I explained that I did not want him there and that he wanted to know about my friend, my manager asked if I wanted him to talk to Mike. He was actually a pretty awesome manager, and I definitely said yes and I felt relieved. After that, Mike went back to doing a lap and leaving until my manager eventually stationed a big loss prevention guy at my register as a deterrent. And it worked. No more Mike at work. And I felt that I had won. Except, I had not counted on Mike being extra creepy. He started showing up at my house. Couple of points, Mike did not have a car. And I lived in a different town than Mike. My family and my job, about 20 minutes by car away. No public transportation in my town or in his. Uber did not exist in this area then either, and Mike didn't have a job as far as I knew. Mike knew where I lived because when I first moved in, we had a housewarming party and accidentally made the Facebook invite public. Mike started coming over at random times, sometimes early in the morning, sometimes in the evening, always asking to speak to Emma. I always told him Emma wasn't there. And even if she was, for her safety, I advised her to not come to the house anymore and to tell Mike that she wasn't interested, which she did. Bluntly, no more distancing and blocked him. And this time, I moved in a new roommate, a co-worker, who while also female had a gun and a big boyfriend. Mike started coming by less frequently, and anytime he did, I would tell him that he wasn't welcome. Now, I know I should have called the cops, but there were two things preventing me. One, I was from a not-grand family who avoided cops for the most part. And two, my new roommate was a criminal law major and she was already concerned about how that would appear for her career. 
Not great reasons, but for a 19 to 20 year old, it was enough reason for me not to mention it. Eventually, I stopped seeing Mike, but I would still occasionally spot him in places that I was in. The mall, my town's grocery store, and my dog's favorite park. So, I stopped posting on Facebook around this time, because even though Mike was blocked, he was clearly still able to see my post. I also got the creeping suspicion that he was coming by my house sometimes. My stuff on my porch would be moved, and at night, my motion sensor lights would go off. I kept finding Mike's cigarette buds, but at least it was the same kind that he smoked. My roommate had been there about four months, when one night, she had her boyfriend over when someone started pounding on the door. When her boyfriend answered, he saw someone who looked like Mike running away. The next day, my roommate and her boyfriend went out of town for a concert. She gave me her gun, even though I already felt safe because she had gotten a dog that she was training as a guard dog. I started watching a cooking show in the living room, and at some point I fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up to my dog and the guard dog losing their minds, barking like mad at the window. There was a tall figure that bolted as soon as I sat up. I grabbed the gun, opened the door and yelled, I know that's you. I have a gun and I'm calling the cops. Which I didn't do. I just locked me and the dogs in the bathroom and then called my dad, who luckily was not angry about being woken up in the middle of the night. He drove over and advised calling the cops and filing a restraining order, which we called the cops, but they said since nothing was broken and there was no evidence, there was nothing to be done about it. Luckily after this, I heard through the grapevine that about a week after the incident with the dogs, Mike's family sent him to live with a relative in a different state. He did come back a couple of years ago, but he was wise enough to only contact me once. And when I got to tell him that Emma was not only happily married, but not at all interested in talking to him, I reminded him that I was willing to call the cops if he ever came near either of us again. And he never did, and I didn't see him anymore. Though he did try to befriend my husband on Facebook, all it took was another block for him to go away. So, it's been about five years since I last saw you. Mike, let's not meet. When I started high school, I feel I had some pretty close encounters due to my naivety. I'm a female and had very poor self-esteem, so while I did have some close friends, I was also quiet and reserved. However, as I was going into a new school, I wanted to put myself out there more. I wanted crazy memories with my friends. I wanted to try new things and maybe get my first boyfriend. So in order to do this, I wanted to change myself so I could be happy with who I was. My birthday was over the summer, so I saved up as much money as I could and finally convinced my parents to let me dye my hair a deep purple and black, and even started doing some of those makeup tutorials. I know it may sound stupid to some, but I know there were a lot of girls that felt the same way as me at the time. Again, I know it sounds stupid now, but it really made a difference to me. I walked into that school for the first time feeling like a different person, except I was still the quiet, smart girl in the back. The first few months were not unusual. My friends and I hung out between classes. All four of us were able to dye our hair, so we had a bit of an ego boost and we did have some people notice too. There was one girl in particular, Shelby, that was on the choir team that complimented my hair, which made me feel great because she was one of the more charismatic girls. She wasn't the mean and popular type because she was genuinely friendly with anyone, 
and she had a lot of friends, but she just never really talked to me except for in passing. That's where things started changing for me. While my friends and I were leaving PE, we were singing some stupid song when Shelby complimented me on my voice. She was in the same class, so she could hear us. She said I should try for choir next year, which I never would have thought about being the person I was. From there, she began talking to me more. I would help her on assignments in class, and she even brought in her makeup once to do mine before first period. We started hanging out outside of school and became pretty close friends. Me hanging out with Shelby also meant I was around more guys than just my brother and his friends. The ones she hung around started paying attention to me, and I didn't dislike it. It was different, and something I wanted out of high school. One night, Shelby was staying over at my house and helping me dye my hair again. While we were waiting, we started messing around on my laptop. She showed me her Facebook page and a few other sites that she would go on, and showed me another website that I had never heard of before. To explain it the best I can, it was supposed to be like a blog targeted towards teenagers as a safe place to talk about your concerns, fears, things like that. You could vent there or just share your creativity. It was all text-based, so you couldn't send or receive pictures. Shelby posted a lot of lyrics to her favorite songs or poems she wrote. She said there was a private message option which was like an email, but still no media could be sent or received. She said she used this a lot since her parents monitored her email too. So I followed and set up an account as well. She helped me set up her personalized wallpaper and bio, and pretty quickly I had a lot of supporters, which were like friends or followers. I started using this daily. I would post music lyrics, poems, or songs I wrote, little tidbits about my day, and so forth. I even tried helping others that were not in a good state of mind when I could. It almost became like a job for me. That was the problem, though. I do admit I had been told by teachers on a few occasions to put my phone away and once had it taken away by a teacher. It was my English teacher. He was weird in the sense that he was always cheerful to talk to, especially when we first got into class. If you needed help with something or needed more time on a project, as long as it wasn't abused, he was willing to help. But if you interrupted him in even the slightest during lecture, he seemed to come unglued. He would slam his hand on a desk, do that ear-piercing whistle thing, and I, unfortunately, got caught on my phone and he took it from me. I had to get it back from him at the end of the day. I was more careful with having it out, especially in his class. Going back to this site, other than what it was intended for, some people used it to set up fights. It unfortunately was not blocked on the school's network, so when one larger fight took place, they were able to check the history under their logins and see this site. Because of this, the site was blocked from the school network and the teachers were not very well aware of this too, and started monitoring harder for phones that were out. I was not a fighter, so I never used it for that. But I did on occasion have a few guys on there that I talked to and flirted with. There was even a new section added where you can give people virtual gifts for points, which you earn for doing certain tasks, such as logging in, making a post, things like that. The gifts can then be sent with a name, or you can send it anonymously. I got a few from people I knew, but then I started getting ones weekly that were anonymous. I thought it was cool, and showed my friends the gauge if they were doing it. They claimed they didn't, and were just as excited and curious as myself to know who it was. I figured, if not them, maybe it was a mutual friend, or maybe I really did just have an admirer. So I made a post about it, saying something about how I appreciated them. The next day, I got a response from a username I wasn't familiar with, saying it was them and that they were happy I liked them. 
My friends didn't recognize the name either, so me being me deduced it as someone who did actually like me. From then on, they would reply to all my posts with a compliment on it, then would call me beautiful, gorgeous, etc. I really didn't mind it for a while. I started getting private messages from the same person saying I was perfect for them. I tried asking who they were, but all they would tell me was that they went to the same school, but were too scared to approach me. I tried to convince them to, but they always refused, but the messages didn't stop. Hello, beautiful. Good morning, princess. I hope my goddess has a great day. I remember the messages like that because they creep me out to this day, and I have troubles with hearing it now. This went on for a while, but it started getting old. That's all they ever did, so I started ignoring it. I don't think they liked that, though, because they began to beg me to acknowledge them, and they finally got that when the messages became more explicit and vulgar, started talking about my body and what they would do to me. I still didn't have a boyfriend, so I didn't even know how to react to that. So I just decided to block that person. After about a week or so, I started getting the same type of messages from a new name, so I immediately blocked it too. Thinking they may have gotten the hint, I moved on as normal. Towards the end of the semester, PE then had swim classes, and since it was my last period for the day, sometimes I would just walk home in my swimsuit and cover up. By the time I had gotten home and showered, I had messages from a new person that specifically mentioned my swimsuit and something along the lines of how it was hard to resist not snatching me up from the name of my street. Now, this made me panic a bit because now I am really being followed and they know where I live. I just sent them a message saying to leave me alone and block them again. They didn't stop. I can't tell you how many more this person made and how many more messages I would get where they just got worse and worse. They would describe what I was wearing or where I was when they saw me, what they wanted to do to me, and even kept saying they were going to take me away and kept putting the date and counting down the days. April 17th. I hate that day now. There's always something there that makes me think I need to watch my back on that day. This all started to crash down when we were in study hour and Shelby asked me about going to her birthday party and it was going to be the weekend of April 17th. I lost it. I felt horrible, but part of me thought it was her screwing with me this whole time and I started yelling and crying. The teacher walked me to the counselor's room where I told her everything that was happening. My parents were called in and they called the cops to have it all reported. They weren't upset that I hadn't told them about it, but were more so concerned about finding out who did this to me. Since they thought it was a fellow student at first and they knew the students had access to the site at the school, they began trying to trace back the usernames that were messaging so I had to go back in and unblock those names as well. To my surprise, they were eventually able to find out who had created those and who was messaging me. It was our English teacher. This sick freak was messaging those explicit things to me, and after checking his computer, they found out I wasn't the only one. He was definitely arrested and is in prison now. The website is gone too. It only got worse from there and it ended up being shut down, thankfully. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Feeling like you have to look over your shoulder everywhere you go is just an awful way to live. And parents, no matter how much they may hate you for it, monitor what your kids do online. You have no idea some of the things that can and do happen right under your nose. This happened a few years ago, when I was in my early teens. I recalled these events recently when a friend reminded me of them, 
so I apologize for my fuzzy memory. For context, I am a female living in a relatively safe country with low drug use. This led to me not worrying too much about my safety when I was out alone. Well, until I met him. After school, I would take the bus home. Depending on the bus I took, I had to cross at a traffic light. I was waiting to cross the road when I felt like I was being watched. At first, I was confused as this was in the afternoon with a decent amount of traffic. But then, I locked eyes with him and I immediately felt unsafe. He was significantly older and bigger than me. From across the street, I could see his eyes were bloodshot and he looked at me with such rage that I froze. Then, he started walking toward me through the rush of cars, almost getting hit in the process. This did not stop him. It only made him angrier and he moves towards me faster. This snapped me out of my shock and I walk as fast as I could away from him without running. I was convinced that if I ran, he would start running after me. I never imagined myself in this situation and panicked. I knew that I could not lead him near my house, so I tried to lose him in between a random stretch of houses. This worked, as he could not keep up and eventually lost me. However, without the sound of traffic, I could hear him speaking. He repeated things along the lines of, Just wait till I get my hands on you. And, Girls like you are only good for one thing. I was in a school uniform, so I don't know how he arrived at that conclusion. When I got home, I broke down and I called my parents. I was convinced that he would find me home alone, and we tried to file a police report that day, but could not, on the account of him not actually being a threat, and him having a record of mental illness. I found out that he lived near my neighborhood, which made me even more uneasy. I did not see him for a few days as my classes would end at different times. I thought that this was a single incident, and I hoped not to see him again. However, the next week as I alighted at a different bus stop, he saw me. I think this helped him find the general area of where I lived, and I started seeing him around more. I would see him around after school, when I went out on the weekends, and eventually in the morning before school. This went on for about four months. Usually, he would come toward me in the same manner with the same rage and intensity as the first time. But I realized, he never closed a distance between us. I think he simply liked seeing people scared. My parents again tried to gather evidence of the stalking to take legal action, but it was brushed aside. They then tried to find the man themselves to confront him. But strangely, he never showed up when they were around. I believe he watched me, and he learned my schedule as he would appear at places where I should be, but only show up when I was alone. What still scares me is that this makes him seem more intelligent than the authorities believe him to be. And I thought this nightmare would never end, but one day, he just disappeared. No one saw him for a couple of years, and in that time, I pushed the stalking out of my mind. However, I crossed paths with him near my house two years ago, and I don't even know how to describe the exchange. My mind literally went blank, and I don't remember most of it. It was his voice that I first recognized, and what happened next was a blur. I can only describe it as a fight-or-flight response. The year's worth of anger and fear took over, and my mind literally blanked out. He locked eyes with me and started coming towards me the way he used to. Except this time, instead of trying to get away, I went towards him. This, I assume, caught him off guard as he froze. I have no recollection of doing so, and the only thing I can remember is physically shaking and feeling cold from the anger. I heard myself yell something at him, but I don't process what it was. 
He then refused to make eye contact, and I watched him walk past me. I saw him once again after that, and he simply ignored me. And thinking about it rationally, I know what I did could have ended badly, but I really don't know what came over me. This actually happened to me a few years ago. I started working at a local gas station part-time after high school. I figured if I'm staying home, might as well do something productive and make my own money too. Most shifts were at night, so they were either dead or full of drunks, but I usually worked with one other person, so it wasn't too bad, especially when we had people get out of hand. I actually liked it for the most part. On the slow nights, I let the neat freak come out in me and I started to organize the shelves better so that everything is lined up right, not scattered around and piled up. There was one guy, Mark, that usually worked the night shifts with me and he'd play music on his phone so it wasn't completely silent, which was nice. One downfall though was that I didn't have a car anymore as mine finally died on me so I had to rely on rides from my parents, friends, or sometimes an Uber to get me to places. Still, it was manageable because I only lived a few miles away from my home, so I could even walk there. I believe it was in late September when this happened because it wasn't too hot, but it started getting cooler overnight. I had decided to walk to work since it was nice out, and my parents weren't home to take me anyways. It was a normal shift, except it was also football season, so we were a bit busier before games started, dead while it was on, and then we'd get a quick burst of people at the end. As I'm ringing people up, I looked up to see my line, and I noticed a guy in basketball shorts, socks with sandals on, and a shirt that said something about a gun show. I roll, am I right? He was looking right at me and smiling, so I just smiled back and continued working on the line. After a few, I looked back and noticed the line wasn't going down, so I called for Mark to come up and help. Sandal Guy was up next. I noticed he had one of those tall cans of tea and nothing else, and he was still smiling, so I just said, sorry you had to wait for just this. Without taking his eyes off of me, he said, Oh, it's all right, sweetie, as long as I get to see your beautiful smile. I haven't really dated much, nor have I had much experience in flirting, so I didn't really know how to react. Not to mention, he had to be close to my parents' age, so I just made some weird chuckle sound and didn't say another word. He paid with a card, I handed him his receipt, without saying another word to him, and he said, Good night, sweetie, and walked out. I didn't have time to process what happened, as I had a few more people in line, so I just continued until we cleared out again. When I was done, I was about to ask Mark to help me with something when he said, Oh, sure, sweetie. He was a nice guy. We never had problems with each other, so I knew he was teasing, but... It snapped me back to that when I started laughing and asked, So you saw that too? Was that not weird? He said he thought the dude was weird, but the flustered side of me was adorable. Funny to him, but I didn't know what to say, and the guy was just off, so none of that was enjoyable. Our night went back to normal for a while. He was in the back again as he did some of the book work while I was messing with the shelves. We were kind of shouting back and forth about something that we were both really involved in when someone came in. I started walking back around the corner when I noticed it was Sandal Guy again. He noticed me and waved, so I waved back, and he started quickly walking towards the coolers in the back. I quickly made a comment to Mark about him being there and just waited for the dreadful checkout. He walked up to the counter and said, I forgot to get gas. If that was the case, why did he walk to the back? I just smiled and rang him up. As I handed him his receipt, he made sure to reach further in to touch my hand and said, I'm glad I decided to stop here tonight. 
and smiled as he shook my hand. My hand was limp because I wasn't interested in this at all. At this point, Mark had walked out from the back and said, Hey, Kate, my part's done. I'll take over. Thank God. I pulled my arm back real quick and dashed to the back and waited. I didn't hear another word from the guy, but I heard the bell on the door and then Mark walked to the back. He said when I turned around, the guy cocked his head like he was trying to look at my ass when he walked in front of his view. He said when he noticed this, he grabbed his candy and dashed out the door. Who does this right in front of people? Anyways, the rest of the night was okay again. Had some lady come in singing and got Mark to sing, so that was funny. So we were having a good time. It was getting close to closing, so Mark had taken the trash out back so he could smoke, and I was up front again reading a magazine. To my surprise, Sandals walks in again. It had to show on my face that I was not okay with this, but he again immediately smiled and was looking around quickly like he was trying to find something. That's when he grabbed another candy bar and said, For you, Catherine Lee, I can't stay away. Can I give you a ride home so we can talk? I was shocked. My name badge says Kate. I don't go by Catherine or my middle name, so how would he have known that? I didn't know how to reply, so I just said, no thanks, I have a ride. To which he said, but you walked here, right? How would he have known that? I just told him I had a ride and he wouldn't stop, saying he wanted to get to know me more and take care of me. I remind you, I was around 19 years old, and this guy could have been my father. I tried cutting him off to ask him if he was going to purchase anything when he tried to reach for my hand again and I pulled back. At this point, Mark walked back in right as he started pleading. Mark immediately walked over to the guy telling him he needed to leave. He started shouting as he was being pushed out that he'll wait for me. Mark locked the door and made sure I was okay, but I was just more shaken up than anything. He had me doing some other things from there, like more organizing, stocking, anything that was empty, and mopping while he watched the door. He would unlock the door to let people in, then lock it again. At closing, he was finishing the last thing, so I had pulled out my phone and opened Facebook when I noticed I had a friend request. It was Sandal's guy. That's when I figured out where he knew my name from, and also realized that my address was on there. I told Mark about this, and he suggested he take me home. I did not refuse either. As we left, I was looking around to see if he was waiting, but I never saw anyone. As he was driving, he tried to loosen up the tension and joke with me, but I think we were both worried about it still. Once we got to my place, the lights were on, so I knew my parents were still up, thankfully, and I noticed Mark was still there when I had gone in and locked the door. I thought it was just to make sure I got in okay. After I was in, I changed clothes and went to get something to eat when there was a knock on the door. It was the cops. They were explaining that there was a report of a suspicious person and gave a description of the vehicle and then the person. You know it, it was the same guy. So I had to explain to the cops and my parents what had happened. The cops said they would drive around a few times to make sure he didn't come back, and thankfully he didn't. But they did tell us that if he came back, to call them again. Unfortunately, there was little they could do since he hadn't actually done anything. The next time I worked though, Mark explained what had happened. He said he noticed a car following us, but didn't want to say anything and scare me. After I got inside, he saw the truck turn the corner onto my road, so he got out of his car and noticed it was the same guy as he was driving by. He said he thinks he recognized him too as he started to speed up. So he had called the cops to report it for us. I was so incredibly thankful for what he did too. Thankfully, we never saw the guy again, so hopefully he got the hint, but you can bet I did a lot of cleanup on my Facebook, too.
This story began when I was 19 years old. I was living in a large Canadian city. I had graduated high school the year prior, and I was struggling to find a job while deciding what I wanted to study in college. For context, I was living in a crowded neighborhood, and just a five-minute walk up the street, you would reach a busier road with lots of little cafes, small markets, pharmacies, bars, restaurants, parks, pretty much everything you needed was nearby, and everybody knew everybody. My father spent his retirement days taking a walk up the street to meet with his buddies at a bar. One of his close friends worked as a janitor at the pharmacy just across the street, and due to his troubling back pains, he offered me a job to help him clean the building after hours to help ease the pain off his back, and he would pay me cash every week. Of course, I accepted. It was short hours, easy cash, and very close by. And best of all, I would have an empty building to work in and did not need to interact with people. Since the pharmacy building was just across the street from the bar my father would most likely be at, I would stop to chat with him before going to work. One of my father's friends, let's call him Frank, was a 60-year-old man. He was having a beer with my father one afternoon. Frank was always really friendly to me, and I didn't mind interacting with him. However, things have shifted, and I started feeling afraid of Frank. One evening, as I'm working in the pharmacy, clearing out the trash and mopping the floors, I glanced out the front doors, which thankfully are locked by this hour, and I noticed Frank pacing back and forth right in front of the building. I thought nothing of it, and I just continued cleaning up. An hour later, I passed by the front doors again and noticed Frank is still standing outside. By this point, it's nearly 10 p.m. and it's dark outside. I unlocked the door and asked if he was okay. He responded by saying that he wanted to know what time I got off work. Being young and naive, I thought that that was okay to ask since I knew him and I told him that I finish whenever I'm done cleaning up but I did not mention that I was nearly done for the night. Luckily, by the time that I was finished and I was ready to head home, the street was completely dead silent and deserted. The very next night, I headed out to work at 5 p.m. and began cleaning up. This building is divided into two separate buildings, the main one and the one office next door has a different address. This means... Sometimes I need to exit the main building and walk outside to get to the other building. This night, I had my mop with me and a few garbage bags heading into the next door building. And as I stepped outside, there was Frank standing around again, facing the building as if he's waiting for me. I felt uncomfortable and a little bit afraid. He tried talking to me but I can't remember what he was trying to say as I was too confused and I was just hurrying over to the next building. I got inside and I locked the door right behind me, leaving Frank outside. It was a small office building, so I was done within 30 minutes. And as I headed to the door to head out, Frank was still standing there. I did not want to leave until he was gone. And at some point... My boss calls me on my cell phone to ask why I was taking so long. And I couldn't help but explain to him that Frank, which is also his friend, was standing outside waiting for me. And a minute later, I heard my boss come outside and yelled at Frank to leave me alone while I'm working. Thank goodness. I finished my work for the night and I peeked out the doors to see if the coast was clear before heading home. I was relieved to see that not a single person was out there. Then again, it was beyond 10 p.m. I walked up the street to wait for the crosswalk to turn green so I can cross and head home. 
and as I am waiting, I hear someone behind me. I turn to see who it is, and sure enough, it's Frank. I wanted to cry of frustration and fear. He approached me and began a normal conversation, pretending that he wasn't being creepy at all. He was telling me that he wants to take me to the movies. That night, I laughed and I was too shy to tell him to F off, and I said, What? It's late already. He said it's okay, that there are movies that late at night anyway, and insisted that I went home to change, meet him back at the corner, and he would take me to the movies while he waits there for me to come back. He asked for my phone number, and being too scared and stupid, I began giving him my digits. And luckily, I snapped back into focus mode and changed the last two of my digits. I pretended to go home to change and then to meet him later. I hope he waited there all night because I went to shower, I got into bed, and I went peacefully sleeping. A few days later, I went up the street to visit my dad at the bar before my next shift. The store connected to the bar and had a shoe sale going on and had set up a table full of shoes outside to attract more customers. I walked past, not interested anyway. But there was Frank, just outside the bar. He stopped me and guided me to the table full of discounted shoes and said he wanted to buy a pair, whichever one I liked. But by this point, I was fed up and ignored him and I entered the bar. I approached my dad and he noticed Frank talking to me outside and asked what we talked about. I was too embarrassed to tell him the truth, so I said, Oh, nothing really. And right after I answered that, Frank was standing at the doorway of the bar talking to some guys and my blood started to boil and I ended up telling my father the truth instead. Actually, he offered to buy me a pair of shoes. Absolutely enraged, my father stood up tall in his chair and gave me a look of, What did you just say? And I then told him everything. Frank has been waiting for me outside of work too, and then he tried taking me to the movies late at night one night. My father did not even waste another second. He walked up to Frank and right away punched him right in the neck in front of a crowd of people. Don't you ever speak to my daughter again. Don't you ever approach her, you son of a bitch. He yelled. Frank was shocked, apologized to my dad repeatedly, looked me right in my eyes and apologized to me and then he walked away. I thought that that was the end of it, and I hadn't seen Frank anywhere for a few weeks after that. And suddenly, my father started going to a different bar, just ten steps away from the first one. It was a much darker, quieter, and really just depressing looking bar. The further in you go, the darker it gets. My father and I sat at a little table and started chit-chatting, and from the top of his shoulder... I noticed a man sitting in the far end of the bar, in almost complete darkness. I knew it was Frank, but I did not panic, nor did I mention it to my father, because I knew he was staying away after being throat-punched in public. Eventually, my dad moved to sit at the bar instead of the table, so of course, I followed. Frank then sat a little bit closer to us, still keeping a distance though. And after starting to feel uncomfortable from Frank's stares, I asked my father, Can we sit at the front of the bar? I just want to be closer to some sunlight. He agreed, so we moved again to the very front. A minute later, Frank changed tables again, closer to us once more, and he looked really angry and revengeful. I can't explain it. He just looked very pissed off and liked the Frank that I knew beforehand. After a while, we decided to head home. It was a five-minute walk for me, but my father, being elderly with physical issues, he needs to take a few breaks here and there to rest his back and then catch his breath again. 
and while we were walking, he needed to take his first break so he sat down on the edge of someone's concrete fence. And as I waited for him to rest, I noticed in quite some distance behind us, Frank is heading our way, but he was stopped standing in the middle of the sidewalk, just staring in our direction. He was far enough away that I wasn't too worried. Then my dad got up and we continued walking, having no idea who was behind us. A minute later, he needed to rest again. I turned around to check and of course, Frank is still there. He seemed to stop walking every time we stopped walking. And this happened a few times and I was getting more and more freaked out. Frank did not know where I lived and even though I lived so close to work, where he was stalking me, he never really followed me home, thankfully. Well, until that day. We got really close to the house now and Frank was catching up behind us. I did not want him to know where I lived so I lied to my dad and I said, I really need to use the washroom. Do you mind if I go ahead? Of course, he had no problem with that and I hurried up home. I wanted to get inside before Frank saw which house I went to and I immediately went up to my bedroom window which faces the road we were on. This is when I noticed that my hurrying home makes no difference because Frank could just wait and see which house my father goes into. And as I'm watching through my bedroom window, I saw that my father noticed who was behind him. He yelled at him to F off. I guess my father protected us also and stood there until Frank went away beyond him so he doesn't see where we live. After a while, Frank very, very slowly walked past every house and my father standing a dozen feet behind him, waiting for him to leave. He looked at every house trying to see if he could see me through a window. I was well hidden, and he would not have seen me, and as he continued making his way down the street, he got so frustrated that he started punching himself in the head a few times. I can't help but wonder what his plan was if he was so angry and following us home that day for the first time with a face full of rage. That was the last that I ever saw of him before I learned years later that he got severely mentally ill and was put into an institution. So Frank, let's never ever meet again. My story is one that is pretty messed up, and I'm not saying that lightly. This was probably the lowest point of my life, and was absolutely something that gave me some sort of PTSD, but it's an important story for me to tell to the world, in my opinion. I was abused and mistreated by this person, and it's a bumpy ride, so if that's not something you can stomach, I don't recommend reading the rest of this. I dated a guy named Cole for most of my time in high school. I met him at the end of my freshman year, and we actually started dating at the beginning of my sophomore year, and we were together until we graduated. Neither of us was one of the popular kids, and neither of us really stood out of the crowd, so we just kind of really enjoyed each other's company and being together with someone that was like me and really nice. Well, that's what it was on the outside, at least. To everyone in the school, my parents, and the public eye, we were just two shy high school kids that liked to hold each other's hands. In private, however, he was emotionally manipulative and horribly controlling. My home life wasn't great. My parents argued nonstop, and they were always so aggressive with each other, so... I guess as I was growing up, I kind of connected that to love. So when Cole started doing the same thing to me that they did to each other, I thought it was normal. It didn't take long for that emotional manipulation to turn into physical abuse and then sexual abuse. Basically, if he wanted to do something, we would just do it and I had to accept it because he loved me and that was that. 
This went on for over a year and a half, until spring break of my senior year. I spent the week over at my grandmother's house in an attempt to get away from him, even for just a little bit, though I framed it that I hadn't spent time with Granny for a while, which was true. While I was there, my grandma actually saw a bruise that was on my inner thigh, and the whole thing spiraled. I broke down and told her everything. She was horrified to hear what had been happening between us, but once she calmed me down, she basically told me that I needed to exit the relationship as quickly as I could. We talked about it some more, and I agreed with her. She had convinced me that I needed to get away from Cole, and I needed to get away as soon as possible. Once spring break was over, he came over to my house, and I was adamant that we needed to spend time in the living room instead of my room, because I knew what would happen if we went behind closed doors. Throughout the evening, I just kind of sat alone on the couch and kept my distance while I prepared for what I had to do, and then, once he had to leave, I ended up telling him that I thought we should take a break from each other. I saw by the look on his face that he wanted to smack me, something he had pretty much turned into his rebuttal when he thought what I said was wrong, but he didn't, because my mom was in the other room and he had to keep up his good kid appearances. He asked me if I was sure I wanted to do that in a way that almost sounded threatening, but I nodded and said that I enjoyed our time together, but that I needed some time to think things through. He basically just left after that, but he did not leave me alone. He was dead set on winning me back in some way, whether that meant by telling me how much I meant to him or telling me that I would be sorry for what I had done. I tried my best to ignore the notes, the letters in the mailbox, the constant phone calls, but I couldn't ignore the literal brick through my window. Yes, he literally threw a brick through my window, complete with a small note that said, I love you, Kayla, and I will die without you, complete with his signature. Thankfully, that was enough to make this whole thing a lot easier, as my dad called the cops and he was subsequently arrested because he admitted that he did it. I was actually happy that this happened because I would be able to move on, focus on school, and he wouldn't be there to distract or bother me. I thought that was where it would all end. He was charged, told to stay away, and I finished high school without any issues. After I graduated, I moved out and then moved in with my grandparents and went to college. I spent four years furthering my education and lived with them, then went and got my own place a few miles from their house at an apartment complex down the way. I lived there for six years, so at this point, I had been on my own for a decade, had started my own career, and had met a guy that I was dating, and things were pretty serious. Basically, I had moved on with my life, and I was happy despite what I had gone through. Recovery was difficult, but I felt like I had successfully managed to do so. Unfortunately, things went south really fast one random day when I got a phone call from a number I didn't know. I answered it, and I wish that I hadn't. As soon as I said hello, the voice on the other end said, Hey, Kayla, it's Cole in a tone that was way too excited to be on this call. As soon as he said my name, my blood ran cold, and there were legitimate chills running down my spine. This was a voice that I never wanted to hear again, and the fact that he had somehow found my phone number was something else altogether. I kind of sheepishly said hi, and then asked what he wanted. He laughed when I responded, then said something like, don't sound so excited to talk to me, then started in with what he was calling for. He asked me if I would be a reference for a job that he was applying for because he needed someone to tell them that he was a good person and willing to do the work. I basically just said, okay, and wrapped the call up as quickly as I could. The feeling in my stomach was literally the worst thing that I had felt since he and I were together. 
I ended up telling my boyfriend what had happened, and thankfully he was fully supportive and willing to keep me calm and talk me through the situation. At the end of it, he pretty much told me that I should just not answer any numbers that I didn't recognize and just move on and pretend that it never happened. He then said that if I wanted, we could go up and change my number. I told him that it was okay and that I would just not answer any more calls that I didn't know. That would have been a great solution and would have been enough if what happened next didn't happen. About a week after that happened, I went into the office to work and sitting in the lobby was cold. I opened the door and literally just froze the second I saw him. My heart was racing and I'm pretty sure I started hyperventilating because I was feeling dizzy. As soon as he saw me, he stood up and walked over to me, grabbing me and pulling me into a hug. I had no idea what to do. I just stood there, frozen, with his arms around me and not letting go. I wanted to cry. I wanted to throw up. I wanted to literally just stop existing. He was talking in my ear about how much he'd missed me since high school, how happy he was to see me. He said that he was there for an interview to work in the IT department, which was the department that I worked in, and said that he was so excited that he may be working with me. Then what he said made my heart stop. It could be just like old times. As soon as he said that, I immediately pulled myself away from him and walked away as quickly as I could to go and talk to my manager. I walked into his office and I knew that he could see something was wrong because he stood up and asked if I was okay. I let loose, asking him if there was someone named Cole that was there for an interview. He told me that he was and that he was there to interview for a position that was on our team and then asked if I knew him. I explained everything to him. I pretty much just dumped the entirety of my trauma on him and told him that Cole was the cause of it. He then followed that up with saying that he would keep that in mind and ask me if I had a restraining order on Cole. I knew what this meant. It meant that he did not care and that he was going to proceed as if I never told him any of this. The restraining order question was a matter of covering himself legally. I told him no, and he ended the conversation pretty much right away. I went back to my desk, but I think I spent most of that day in the bathroom just staring at the wall and having a panic attack. That was the last day that I worked there, because I knew what was going on. Some of you may say that it was purely coincidence that he was interviewing for the same company that I was working at, But it wasn't. He didn't seem surprised to see me. He never once said anything about not knowing I worked there. And his comments made me feel more like he knew it. And he was trying to pretend like he didn't. I know it sounds paranoid. But he got my number. He went to my office. He interviewed for a position on my team. None of this was a coincidence. Like I said, I ended up quitting that day. Didn't even put in my two weeks just in case. I wasn't willing to give him any more time around me. I also went and changed my number after that day, so he didn't have it. Thankfully, this time around, I had more of a support system in place. My boyfriend, my grandparents, and a few friends. They all supported me in my decision, and they helped me get my mind straight. So, that's it. That's the story of my horrible ex that showed up randomly in my life 10 years later. It was hard to get through, and I still feel like someday he's going to show back up in my life to cause me more distress. Thankfully, he hasn't. If he ever does, I'm honestly not sure what I'll do or what it'll do to me. I was always an extremely small and sickly child. I look young for my age, and my family and I lived out of town, about eight miles out. Our little community was next to a highway. The school bus would drop me off two blocks away from home. One day, 
I noticed a red truck following slowly behind me. So slow that I figured they were just looking for a house or something. I ignored it and I walked to my house and that was the end of that. Consistently, this truck would follow slowly behind me and after a couple of days of this, I walked into my house and I looked out the window. Inside there was an older man in a black lab. He was staring at me, idling inside his truck, and then he pulled away. I decided that enough was enough. I told my parents and of course, my sister was quick to jump that I was lying, but my mom thankfully believed me. She drove me to the bus stop the next morning, and the red truck was there, across the street at the gas station, pointing towards the bus. I got on the bus and my mom decided to drive around the truck. She described the scene. The man was disheveled and dirty, hunched over in his seat just staring at the bus. His license plates were caked in mud, so she couldn't make them out. It freaked her out so much that she called the police and the school. I went to school and I was quickly pulled into the office, and the man had been spotted at the school waiting in his truck. That day, I rode the bus home. This time, the truck was parked alongside the street. That means that I would have to walk past this man's driver's side door so that I could get home. I debated, considering running for it. But apparently, this man was getting desperate now that he was spotted. A police car showed up and I talked to the policeman. They went to go to talk to the man and he quickly pulled away from the curb and took off down the highway. I never saw him again and I don't believe he was ever caught. But because of this experience, I am extremely guarded and paranoid with my own daughter and her soon-to-be sibling. The world is a terrifying place these days and children go missing so easily. I don't like to think about if I had been grabbed, I wouldn't be here typing this and my kids wouldn't exist. I was lucky. Many children aren't. So, stranger, with ill intentions, let's not meet. It happened in 2002. I was living in a ground floor apartment in the corner of an L-shaped building with a living room, kitchen, parents' bedroom on the garden balcony side and my sister's bedroom and bathroom on the parking side. I was seven years old at the time of the facts and all this happened over several weeks, maybe months, but I hope not. At the beginning of the summer of 2002, I was often playing in the common gardens of the building with other children of the building, when one afternoon, my mother called me and my friends to ask us if it was one of us who, to play, would have taken one of her panties that was drying on the floor of our terrace, and that it was not right to play with women's underwear. But it wasn't us, and as the weeks went by, Several similar cases were reported to us, but always without explanation. Sometime after these events, my father not being able to sleep, one evening decided to smoke a cigarette at the kitchen's window, which was at the side of the garden, and he was just looking around to clear his mind. As he looked closer at our right neighbor's terrace, my father saw a man standing there, not moving, and looking into their apartment. My father thought that it was the neighbor and said, So, what are you doing, bud? The person turned around and looked at my father. The man was touching himself. Then without saying anything, the intruder ran through the hedge and left through the common gardens. The whole neighborhood was informed, and this could not last any longer. We children were forbidden to play outside in the evening, 
and a feeling of fear settled in among the people of the ground floor. During the year, a new neighbor moved in alone in the apartment, which was above ours. Alerted and a little shocked by the incessant theft of women's underwear in our building, my neighbor legally, and with good reason for my part, bought a dissuasion gun, which shoots and weighs like a real one, but actually shoots blanks, and she kept it in her bedside table. This neighbor loved animals and had two parakeets, which often made noise in a birdcage on her balcony. She had cats, fish, and etc. One evening, this neighbor came back from work. She put her things down and went about her life normally, like any other person coming home from work does. But that evening, she saw on her balcony that unfortunately, the bird cage had remained open and that her parakeets had disappeared. Thinking that it was her own mistake, she was sad, but there was no reason to be afraid at all. After having made her evening, she went to bed and fell asleep. But something woke her up during the night. First, she felt her comforter pull slightly, thinking it was a cat she held the comforter tightly, but it still pulled. Then she felt the bed move and a breath behind her. There was someone in her bed. The feeling of fear took a hold of her. She jumped out of bed while opening her bedside table and took out her pistol and fired twice in the direction of the man who fled by jumping out of her bedroom window, which was open. The whole building was awakened by these shots, including my father who saw a man land in front of our terrace and run into the gardens. He grabbed what he could and then chased him. The police stopped my father who was running in his underwear with a golf putter, and of course, he had to prove that he was a neighbor afterwards. A couple minutes later, the police informed us of the arrest of the man in the housing estate next to us by a patrol that was watching our neighborhood after his thefts of underwear, our surprise was not the least when we learned that the pervert was a man of 45 years, married, father of three children, and in recidivism of several acts of voyeurism and break-ins. He had even entered a lady's house by climbing up the balconies while she was living on the fourth floor. Later, we learned that no charges would have been retained against him because number one, he did not break into my neighbor's house. He did not assault, rape, or even touch my neighbor. And they're not even sure that the thefts are necessarily attributed to him. So, here we are, living in a country where a person with serious voyeuristic urges that lead to other more serious things cannot be supervised by prison or hospital staff because technically, he didn't do anything. Stalker at Kmart I'm dating myself there with that department store reference, but I'll do one better. When I was in my early teens, I'm a male and I would ride my bicycle there to look at and buy model cars and supplies. That was my thing back then, building model cars. I can't say if I was in any real danger, as per the TOU on the sub, but basically, I was stalked. And while I'm deciding between the 66 Chevelle or the 85 Camaro, I see this man mid-thirties walk past the aisle that I'm on. Then, he passes the same aisle from the other end. Once I'd made up my mind and leave the aisle, he's on the far end and starts walking the parallel aisle to me. I'm not weirded out yet, but I make a detour down another aisle to ditch him. Or so I thought. I doubled back and got to the main aisle that heads towards the front, towards the registers. 
he pops out another aisle further up facing me, then turns down the next one. Each time that I encounter him, he smiles, making eye contact. So, I put the model down and turn 180 degrees, head towards the back of the store. There's a service entrance back there, so I make for that, thinking that I'd lost or confuse him, and I still wanted to build the Camaro. So, I went back towards the front. And there he is, sitting on a bench in the lobby, still making contact, still smiling. Now, at this point, the obvious answer would have been to just turn and bolt. But, in an effort to keep my bike from getting stolen, I'd secured it to the railing inside the lobby, and I didn't want to stand still in his presence. I quickly went back into the store and zigzagged the aisles trying to lose him. By now, I was sufficiently freaked out, but still didn't want to make a scene. Every single time that I made my way back out onto the main aisle, there he was. I'm walking at a brisk pace, and he's just casually strolling, but always in my direction. And at one point, I pass the sporting goods, so I pick up and start carrying a baseball bat. I pass the main aisle on purpose now, showing him my weapon. He's unfazed, just casually making his way up and down the aisles, still smiling, still eye contact. I'm just short of running now, almost back in the service department. When he's given up the subterfuge of chance encounters, he's directly following me. He's not at my pace, but manages to keep up. I give up. I toss the bat and make for the service clerk, a relatively stout African-American man, and I say, Hey, I think this guy is following me. Can you call someone? And I'm throwing my thumb in his direction. He hadn't come around the corner yet, so I never saw his reaction. But we heard a crashing and heavy fast footfalls. He had run towards the service entrance, knocking over a display on the way out. The service rider stood by with me while the police were called. And once there... The cops took a statement, did a walk around, but he was long gone. Then, they put my bike in their cruiser and then drove me home. I didn't go back to Kmart on my own again until I was old enough to drive. And I still never went back for that model Camaro. Damn it. Stalked me using technology. When I was in my early 20s, I dated a friend of a friend. We were mutual friends. We saw each other before, but we never really interacted. We certainly knew each other by name. We met at a party and he was great at first. He was friendly and made good conversation and was pretty good looking too. I was instantly interested in him and we had great chemistry with each other. We met up constantly and I was so happy I decided to give him a chance. Months in we decided to go steady and be exclusive with each other. We set our statuses on Facebook and some other places too. We took so many pictures together and posted them on social media. And for nearly 10 months things were going fantastic. He slept over my place plenty of times and I stayed at his too. I really enjoyed being with him. One day I wasn't feeling the best so I told him I wanted a quiet day and spent the day on my computer in a video call with my friends. We were all laughing and watching a movie together. It was so good to have some girl time together because I spent so much time with my boyfriend. One of my friends, I'll call her Dana, made a comment about missing me and jokingly said that I was spending way too much time with him. The next day I didn't hear from my ex, and it wasn't like him to not send a message by now. I messaged him and said good morning. He looked at it and left me on red. Weird, but maybe he was too busy to answer. 
and I didn't worry about it. I waited a couple of hours and sent another message to ask if he was okay. He told me he was fine, and I knew he was clearly not fine. He'd never acted like this before, and I was surprised by it. I told him if he was angry with me, I'd rather he told me why. He asked how sick I was, and I told him it must have been a temporary stomach bug. And that when I felt a little better, I went on a video call with my friends, and we watched a movie. He seemed satisfied by my answer. And at the time, I wasn't exactly sure why. I was just happy that he had calmed down. Things were good again. But months later, we had some more relationship difficulties. He told me he didn't like some of my friends and that he didn't want me to see them anymore. I asked him exactly what he didn't like about them. He just told me he didn't think they were a good fit for me, but wouldn't explain exactly why. There was one person in particular he didn't like, and that was Dana. He always made little nasty comments about her, implying that she was a bad person. I told him I needed a reason why he wanted me to cut them off, and I didn't like him interfering with my friendships. He scowled and didn't speak to me for a couple of days. I talked to Dana about it, and she wasn't sure where the hostility was coming from. She'd always been civil with him. I thought that would be the end of it, but no. He slipped one time and mentioned something I told Dana in private. I thought maybe Dana said it to someone else and asked her about it. She denied it. I was angry about this and he supported me, told me to stop being friends with her, and if I loved him, I would do it. I hated that. I vented to some of my friends both on my phone and on the computer about it. I said how frustrated I was, that he had no right to do what he did, and that it wasn't fair of him to do this. When he confronted me about it, he knew near enough everything I said. I doubted all my friends would have run off to tell him, and some of them barely knew him, or only knew of him. I asked how he knew and he got incredibly defensive. This went on for months, and whenever we had any issues he would always know about them. It turns out he put spyware on my phone and a keylogger on my computer. Probably when I wasn't looking or he needed to borrow my phone or computer for something. I confronted him about this massive breach of privacy and he said it was normal. That all couples do this. I screamed at him this wasn't normal at all. He told me that all his exes had been fine with it. And I reminded him that he never even mentioned it to me. And I certainly wouldn't have agreed. Nor did he ever offer to show me his phone or other devices. I got my computer and phone cleared of any nasties, changed passwords, and did everything I could to protect myself. I made sure I changed all my passwords at a friend's place too. After a while, I couldn't relax so I ended up getting a new phone and computer when I could. I couldn't shake the feeling he was spying on me for a long time after. I make sure to lock all my devices now. I also regularly checked to make sure my information hasn't been leaked, and made sure there were no changes to my private information. It has been so stressful and it could have been avoided if I was more careful. What was even creepier, he left hidden cameras in my room at some point. I'm terrified what he did with those pictures or videos. I change in there. I have so many private moments in there. It's supposed to be my sanctuary. Sometimes I can't escape the feeling I'm being watched. This story won't be the worst story on your list, I guess. I don't let my partners use my devices anymore, unless I'm there to keep an eye on what they're doing. I don't like how he invaded my privacy and had access to my information without my permission. I don't even like inviting people into my room anymore. I just want to feel safe again. Keep an eye on your devices, people. So I'm a 28-year-old woman, and this happened to me when I was 13. I'm an adult now, and still kind of traumatized. For a little context, at 13, I transferred schools because of a lack of money. The school that I went to was a cheaper private school, because where I live, the public ones kind of suck. I didn't have any friends for at least the first couple of months. I then started noticing this boy, Victor. He was always staring at me during classes, in the hallways, by the window, and at lunch. 
It was an everyday thing, but I didn't care because as a kid, I only thought of stupid stuff like dolls or whatever. Oh, and one more thing. I was flat as a table back then, so totally looked like a small child. The girls in my class started saying that Victor had a crush on me, which creeped the hell out of me because he was 18. I was creeped out but still didn't care as long as he didn't approach me or anything. But things escalated quickly. Victor would follow me home every day, and thank God I moved since then, and he doesn't know where I live anymore. The most annoying thing, however, was that he constantly asked his friends to try to talk to me and try to convince me to go out with him and make out with him after school. These talks would usually take about 30 minutes of them trying so hard to convince me to agree with this. While Victor was behind them, just watching the conversation like a freak. Obviously, I rejected him all the time. But being the nice guy that he said he was, he spread rumors about us making out anyway. Nobody believed anyway because he was such a weird guy and the whole school knew it. The final straw was when our school had a trip to a book fair. I was super excited. At this point, I had made a couple of friends, and on our way to this fair, I was on the bus with my friend, and Victor was on three seats behind us, and I could feel his eyes on me the whole way. And out of nowhere, he came and asked for my friend's cell phone, and she gave it to him. So stupid of her. And he returned her cell phone not even two minutes after. She checked the cell phone and showed me that he had taken a bunch of photos of me. I guess this was his way of saying that he had already done this at some point. She got so pissed and went to go talk to him. And when she returned, she said the creepiest thing I've heard in my life. She said this with a very scared face. He, he said to me that when you least expect it, he will push you in a bathroom and creep you today. The only thing that went through my mind was, what should I do now? I looked at him and he gave me a creepy smile. After this, I spent the whole day looking behind my back, not leaving the side of my teacher. She didn't even understand why that I didn't want to walk around the fair. I was in alert mode all the time, and thank God, nothing happened. And when I came home, I cried in my room like a baby. This was at the end of the year, and thankfully, I switched schools again. I told this to my mom last year, and she was like, Yeah, it happens. It happened to me too when I was your age. So shocked about how this is a common thing. I'm now 28, and I still see Victor on the streets. He has followed me around a few times, and I always walk in circles until I lost him. But sometimes, he waits for me outside the stores or restaurants. I think about what would have happened to me in that book fair if I didn't have my teacher next to me the whole time. And I wondered if one day he'll do something or just keep this creepy behavior. Back when I was attending a university, I used to work on campus at one of the dining halls during the dinner or night shift. I lived in the next town over since it was cheaper to live in a crappy little apartment out of town than to live on campus in the dorms. But I didn't own a car, so I had to take the bus. One night, I had just gotten off a shift at work, my feet were killing me, and I was completely exhausted as I slowly made my way to the bus stop. 
I notice a man, much older than me, sitting on one of the two benches at the otherwise empty bus stop, but I didn't pay too much attention to him. I simply sat down on the second bench and listened to some music while waiting for the bus to arrive. The first sign that things were starting to get weird was when I kept noticing out of the corner of my eye that he was staring at me. At first, I thought I might be imagining it, so I looked over and caught him quickly turning his head to look away. Okay, so he was staring at me. This wasn't completely out of the ordinary, since being a young college girl seemed to gain me a bit of attention from older men. So just like usual, I just ignored him. Well, that was a mistake. Again, out of the corner of my eye, I saw him look at me. But instead of just staring this time, he got up and walked over to sit next to me instead. I continued listening to my music, hoping that he would see the earbuds and take the hint that I wasn't interested in having a conversation. But instead, this man literally took the earbud out of my ear. Hey there, sweetheart, he said, as my head snapped to look at him in shock. I should have told him off for touching my things and demanded him to leave me alone. But I was sort of frozen, and I didn't want to make him mad. Uh, hi. I replied quietly. He started introducing himself as Mike and telling me that he lived in the area and it was always nice to see pretty girls like me at the university bus stop. He explained that he was a real man and liked the boys that I went to school with and that I should go home with him that night. I was a shy, scared virgin who had never had a man be as bold as this to my face. And I say to my face because I had certainly gotten my fair share of unsolicited private pictures online by that point, but I digress. I didn't know how to respond, so I didn't, but that didn't stop Mike from continuing to explain to me all of the fun things that he wanted to do with me at his place that night. He got into graphic detail. The things he described started out with the basic things you'd expect, and then escalated to him asking if I liked being choked until I turned purple and passed out in bed. I wish there was anyone else at that bus stop, but it was just the two of us, in the dark alone, as I counted the seconds until the bus would arrive. Then Mike took things to a different level of shocking by telling me, Listen, the demons want me to ask for your phone number and they say you should give it to me, or you won't like what happens. He actually had the audacity to start stroking my hair. His hand was gentle, but I didn't want him touching me at all. This was shocking for a number of reasons. The demons? I wouldn't like what would happen? Why was he touching me? What the hell was this guy talking about? And as though he could read my mind, Mike went on to explain. My therapist knows the demons are real. I told her about them, and she says I'm not crazy and that demons are real. He laughed, then abruptly stopped and said, Now, give me your phone number like they said, he demanded. And as his hand stroked my hair for the last time, he stopped and gripped the back of my neck, still gentle, but even more terrifying. I was scared and obviously didn't want him to have my phone number, but he was taking out his phone and I knew that he was going to call the number I gave him to make sure that I wasn't lying to him and he still had his hand on the back of my neck. So, I reluctantly gave him my real phone number. Stupid, I know. But I was right, and he immediately called to check. All I could think about was just not making this guy angry, 
long enough to get away from him, and then I would block his number. Thankfully, the bus came moments later, and I sat down as close to the front of the bus, near the bus driver, as I possibly could, since the bus was basically empty. Mike decided to sit directly across from me, and at this point, I had tried listening to music again, hoping that being on the bus and him having my phone number would signal to him the end of our conversation. However, he decided to reach over and unzip my sweatshirt, revealing my work shirt and the name tag, which I had unfortunately forgotten to remove in my haste to leave work that night. I hadn't told him my name yet. Abigail, what a beautiful name. Our daughter will be named Celeste. I shouldn't have been shocked at this point, but I was. I had stopped listening to music again and zipped my sweatshirt back up, which made him laugh. You won't need that soon anyway, he said, and winked at me, implying how he'd planned to undress me even further that night. At one stop, Mike tried to convince me to get off the bus with him. I told him no, that I was tired and I just wanted to go home. So he said okay and then stayed on the bus. I knew that had been his stop, so the fact that he was staying on the bus worried me. I was sure this meant that he was planning on coming home with me instead. Baby, Mike whispered to me. I tried to ignore him, but he repeated himself louder. Baby! He had the most unsettling smile on his face, and I asked, What? He laughed and told me, The demons say you smell nice. I was terrified, and I felt like I was going to throw up by the time that my bus stop arrived. I lived in an apartment alone, and I didn't want him to know where I lived. Despite my body being exhausted and sore from work, adrenaline kicked in, and I bolted off the bus and ran straight home. I made it inside and then locked the door. I looked through the peephole, and I didn't see him, so I went to carefully peek out of my window and saw him standing near the bus stop, just looking around. He took out his phone. And sure enough, I started getting a call from an unknown number since I hadn't saved his number. I ignored it, and when he hung up, I started getting several texts asking where I'd gone and how he didn't like hide and seek, and how the demons just wanted to have fun, but I was being a little bitch about it. I was so scared because he knew which apartment building I lived in, where I worked, where I went to school, my phone number, and my name. The only good thing which made me feel slightly relieved was that he didn't know which specific apartment number I lived in. That's when he started yelling outside. There were no specific words said, just wordless yells of what I can only assume were frustration and anger. I blocked his number, and I kept all the lights in my apartment off as I cried with my back to the front door. Maybe I should have called the police, but my brain was so frazzled that I didn't even think of that until the next day. And by then, all I knew about him was that he was a mentally unstable man, probably named Mike, who hadn't actually done any physical harm to me so I didn't think it was worth it. In hindsight, I know that I made a lot of stupid mistakes during this experience. I ended up moving away entirely at the end of that term of school, for unrelated reasons. But until then, I switched to day shifts at work, and I was paranoid every single night. Thankfully, I never saw the man again, though. So, Mike... The scary guy from the bus stop who tried to follow me home. I never want to meet you or your demons ever again. I'm a 30-year-old male. I was having a bit of a dry patch with dating. 
I broke up with my fiancé and I was absolutely crushed by it. I found out that she had been cheating on me through the last six months of their relationship. I didn't want or need anything serious. Mainly, just wanted to see what was out there. Maybe find a friend or something. So, I made my profile, matched with a couple of women who I was attracted to, and I liked their profiles. It was a mixed result. Some of the women seemed to like me, and others weren't really all that interested. It happens though. One of the women seemed nice at first. Let's call her Julie. She worked as a nurse and was pretty busy. Given my job and other commitments, that worked well for me. I didn't want someone who could potentially become too clingy. Julie and I messaged each other, exchanged some pics, and talked to each other. She had a nice voice. I didn't tell her where I worked, but I realized she managed to find out where I worked. I worked as a lawyer in a local law firm, and she came to my workplace. We hadn't even gone on a date or met up yet. I wasn't happy to see her. I came out and spoke to her, and I politely asked her to not come to my workplace again, and that it made me uncomfortable. She agreed that it wasn't the best, and things seemed to go okay. I was completely put off by her behavior that I decided not to have anything to do with her. And I sent her a message later that day and told Julie that I didn't want to talk to her anymore. Looking back, I should have just ghosted her and left at that. I should have removed her and just blocked her. The next day, I go to the office and the security guy walked up to me. He told me that my friend was back again. When I turned to look at her, she was waiting outside the company property. She was just staring at me. I told the security office that I wanted nothing to do with her and to keep her away, and he agreed. I started noticing her around more and more. Eventually, I put her out of my head and I found a woman that I got along with. She always made me smile, and I decided that it was time to give it a go. We went out on a couple of dates together, and after a month or so of dating, we decided to make it official. Things were going so well, and then she called me and sounded upset when I answered. She asked if I was cheating on her, and this took me by surprise. No! I answered her. She told me that someone called Julie messaged her on Facebook and told her that we were together. My girlfriend believed me and told her to fuck off. She kept trying to contact her, and then she disappeared. It took months of Julie harassing my girlfriend before she finally disappeared. I don't know why or how, and I don't care. All I'm happy about is Julie being out of my life. This happened at my previous job, and it's a bit long, so bear with me. I'm 24 and female, by the way. Howard was a senior in my team. One day during Chet Chat, he asked me to recommend some colognes to him as I know a lot about perfumes and fragrances. I recommended some, and then he asked me to help him buy it. I suggested it's better to try it out in person before buying for colognes. But he insisted many times that I buy my recommendation for him. So I did eventually. And after I bought it, I WhatsApp him the receipt, and he texted back, Thanks, I'll treat it as a gift from you. He did pay me back later, so I thought he's just making a joke. The manager of my previous team, Alfred, asked me to go grab a drink after work another day as he noticed that I was frustrated at work lately. 
He also said that I could invite more people if I wanted. So, I invited Kate, my closest friend in the company, who was also in Alfred's team. Kate suggested to me to invite one more colleague, as she believed it was better to hang out in a group of four. I think for a bit, and then I invited Howard, as he had worked under Alfred before. I told Howard that Alfred wanted to buy all of us drinks. I have drinks with Kate and another colleague Aiden together regularly after work, so that was the first time that I hang out with either Alfred or Howard. After the drinks, we decided to take the last scheduled subway home. Only Howard and I live in the same direction, and I knew he lived near stop A from previous chit-chat, which is about 10 stops before my stop. I live quite far away from the subway station, around a one-hour walking distance, so I planned to take taxi after getting off at my stop. After we got on the subway, Howard started to say things that made me uncomfortable. For instance, he asked when he could become as close to me as Aiden, or whether Aiden had been ever to my apartment. To be honest, I wasn't even that close with Aiden, and we were more like work friends. I was annoyed by all those questions, but I thought to myself, it's just a few more stops till stop A, and I'd have my pee soon. Well, Howard didn't get off at stop A. I asked him about it, to which he replied, that he had some errands near stop B tomorrow morning, so he would be staying at a friend's near stop B. Stop B is just one stop before my stop. Luckily, Howard shut up soon probably because of my lack of response, so I just looked at my phone in silence. I just noticed Howard was still there when I was about to get off at my stop. He followed me off the subway and offered to take taxi together. He said he would drop me off at my place and then go to his friend's place, which would make no sense as these two drop-off points are in complete opposite directions at my subway stop. So I declined by saying that I planned to walk home. Then, he offered to walk me home. I said it's an hour away, and I persuaded him to just get a taxi outside my subway stop. He finally budged and called a taxi through the app, which shows the estimated fear. I overheard him murmuring the amount, which was definitely more than traveling from my subway stop to stop B. More like traveling to stop A. I suspected that the stay at his friend thing was a lie all along, just to follow me home. A week later, Kate told me that she overheard Howard insinuated to Alfred that we were in a relationship. We were in a profession where relationships between staff are required to be reported and spouses cannot work in the same team. I was crept out by Howard but didn't bring it up to Alfred as he didn't ask me about it either. A month later, Alfred invited his team and a lot of other people that he previously worked with to dinner just to celebrate the end of a project. And after the meal, Alfred asked me where I was heading to as he knew I have two apartments. Kate and Howard were walking with us. I then told Alfred that I'm going back to the apartment in the same direction of Kate's which was in the opposite direction as Howard's. Howard joined in the conversation and said that he's going to that direction too, as a friend was hosting a party there. Kate and I were doubtful, surely. On the subway, Kate asked him where the party was, and Howard replied at stop C, which was exactly my stop. So, Kate and I pretended that we had other places to hang out, and that I was not getting off at stop C. Howard got off at stop C, and eventually, I rode with Kate to her stop, and then got on another subway back to stop C. 
I avoided him as much as possible before I could quit my job since then. I've quibbled with the thought of publicly sharing my story for a while now. Recently, I've arrived at a place where I think the benefit of sharing outweighs the risk. So, I'm taking a chance and just putting it out there. Maybe it will help someone. Many times I've looked back on the odd events leading up to the scariest night of my life, October 5th, 2015. I'd like to say that I did everything right, but honestly in hindsight, I should have done more. I am convinced that my son, who was 3.5 years old at that time, actually saved me from harm that night. I could have easily became another statistic in the crime database, and although my stalker did not hurt me physically, it took me months to get past the psychological damage. So, here's my story. In May of 2012, I temporarily exited the workforce following the birth of my son, Chris. He was born with a physical birth defect that would require multiple corrective surgeries during his first year of life. He was also born 2.5 months early, which had complicated things further. Chris's father, Aaron, agreed that I should stay home with our son until he was one year old, considering our circumstances. In May of 2013, I felt comfortable enough to leave my son with a babysitter, so I went job hunting. I ended up being hired on the spot as a waitress at a small but very popular chain restaurant in my little town. Well, let's just say that this little diner is widely known for their waffles, and let's just leave it at that. I was hired on to work on the second shift. And after two months, I had worked my way up to the first shift. By the summer of 2014, I had a long built of clientele of regular customers that enjoyed my service and tipped me well, enough for me to have a little put back in savings, which came in handy when Aaron and I broke up. I ended up moving out of our apartment with Chris and renting a small two-bedroom trailer in the same town. It was mid-November of 2014 when I first met Ryan, the man who would later stalk me. It was an abnormally slow Saturday morning shift at the diner. Two men, one late 40s, early 50s, and the other maybe early 20s. They walked into the diner together and sat down in my section. They were my only customers at that time. So, when the older man of the two started making small talk, I had time. The older man introduced himself to me as Ryan, and the younger man with him was his son. Right away, by his body language and tone, I could tell that Ryan was being flirtatious with me. He even cracked a cliché joke saying, Nah, there's no way you work here because you're too pretty and you have all your teeth. Honestly, I wasn't super amused with that tired kind of humor. And while Ryan was decent in the looks department, I was a little annoyed with being casually hit on by him. I was 25 years old at that time and much closer to his son's age. But nevertheless, I faked merriment because a happy customer equals a better tip. It's just part and parcel to the job. Suffice to say that my fake laughing and smiling paid off, earning me a $10 tip on a $20 ticket. They were only there for 30 minutes too. Not too bad, I thought to myself. The following weekend, Ryan came back to the diner. This time, he came alone. There was nothing unusual about this interaction than from the last. I took his order, we chit-chatted when I had time, and I kept his coffee refilled, and that was it. But apparently, he enjoyed his experience because again, he left me a $12 tip on an $8 ticket. 
Ryan began visiting the diner every weekend from then on, up until the end of December. And by then, he had started coming two to three times per week. At this point, he really started showing an interest in getting to know me. Now, that's not something unusual per se. I had some other regulars that I actually developed friendships with. Some even getting me Christmas gifts and such. So, I did tell him things about myself in casual conversation during his visits. Just normal things that normal people talk about. And one of the things that I eventually told him about was the medical miracle that is my son. I even bragged about the fantastic job his doctors did, showing him the before and after photos of his surgeries. And over those past several weeks, Ryan's attitude towards me had changed. He was no longer this annoying, flirty, middle-aged guy, but rather a seemingly caring person. Maybe I was naive, but I genuinely appreciated his kindness, and I did not interpret it as a romantic gesture at all. And Ryan continued coming by on my shifts for breakfast three times a week. February of 2015 is when the first strange event occurred which was soon followed by a string of more. It was a Tuesday afternoon, and I had picked Chris up from the babysitter, and I was heading home from work. Now, where I lived was on a small uphill dead-end road. As you pulled onto my road from the main highway, you could easily see my trailer on the right side at the top of the hill. It was positioned perpendicular to the road, and the back side of it is visible as you drive up the road. And as I eased my way up the hill, something immediately caught my eye. I could clearly tell that my back door was open. I put the brakes on immediately and tried to figure out what to do. I literally never touch or unlock that door, much less open it. So I knew something was off. A door is not going to unlock and open all by itself. I ended up parking my car off to the side of the road and calling Aaron. At this point, we were on good terms and co-parenting our son very well, and Aaron came straight over and checked out my trailer, while I remained back in my vehicle with Chris. About five minutes after entering, he called me and told me that it was all clear. So, I made my way up the hill expecting to have been robbed or something, but nothing was missing. There was no damage to the door, so Aaron basically brushed things off saying that I must have forgotten to close the door myself or something. I knew better, but since there was no sight of a break-in, I let it go. Two days after that, so on Saturday afternoon, I'm off work. I'm heading uphill on the road toward my driveway. My son is spending the weekend with his dad, so I have the house to myself that evening. A wave of relief washes over me as I see that my back door is still closed. Now, I don't know why I decided to do this, but something compelled me to actually inspect the door up close. I needed to also make sure that it wasn't tampered. But to my horror, I discovered that it had. There were pry marks along the edge of the door jamb. I immediately went inside and unlocked the door so I could open it and inspect further. The edge of the door was bent to hell and back on the inside where the doorknob met the jam. That damage wasn't there two days ago when Aaron installed the new lock. I deduced that someone had probably been using that credit card trick to easily break into the door since the way it locked was by the knob. And when they figured out that it would no longer work, they tried to open it not knowing that a new lock was on the other side of the door. I'm thankful that lock held. At this point, I called the police and made a report. They basically told me that there wasn't much that they can do in this instance, other than document the incident, and they told me to call if anything else happened. Needless to say, that wasn't satisfactory to me, but I didn't know what else to do. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping at home that night, so I ended up making the hour drive to my parents' house and crashing there. 
Nothing else happened for a little while, and by March, I had been able to put February's events behind me and feel secure in my home again. I was working and going about life as usual, and at this point, Ryan had begun visiting the diner five days a week. Oddly enough, he was there each shift that I worked, and it became a running joke with the other waitresses, and in a funny way they teased me about having a stalker. Well, I would soon find out just how true that actually was. Because in April, things got weird. I came home from work one day to find my grass had been mowed. Now, I usually paid a neighbor to do it for me since I didn't have a lawn mower. My yard was small, but maintaining it was a requirement for my lease agreement. My neighbor didn't charge much to mow it, and he needed the extra cash. So it was a win-win for us. But I knew that I hadn't asked my neighbor to mow recently, so I thought that it was strange. I asked him if he went ahead and decided to do it anyway, and he said that he hadn't. So I called my landlord and asked her if she had mowed my grass for some reason. I knew my grass hadn't been high enough to warrant that, but it was the only possible explanation. Of course, she said no. She hadn't mowed my grass and I was stumped. I then assumed that an anonymous neighbor must have mowed my grass out of the goodness of their heart. You know, like a pay-it-forward kind of thing. I mean, what else was I to think? And all throughout April and the beginning of May, my grass was being anonymously mowed once per week. I know it sounds strange reading it, but at that time, I genuinely thought a neighbor was just doing neighborly things and didn't want to be recognized for it. On May 5, 2015, Aaron and I decided to take Chris to the zoo. When we got back from the zoo late that afternoon, we discovered that my front door was cracked open. Ah, uh, now, my front door did have a deadbolt, but I must have forgotten to lock it. How freaking stupid of me. You can imagine how upset I was due to my back door being tampered with multiple times back in February. I just didn't understand why this was happening again. And like all the other times, nothing was taken. My belongings seemed untouched. Yes, I was feeling targeted, but I didn't call the police because I felt like I technically had nothing to report. There was nothing stolen or vandalized, just an open front door. So, I let it go again. And two days later, I would discover the death of things. May 7, 2015. It was one of my rare off days, and I was at home relaxing with a diner cold me. I answered thinking maybe my boss wanted me to come into work. Well, it wasn't my boss, but my co-worker Celia. She stated that someone named Mary called the diner asking to speak to me. Mary had asked for me by name, and since I wasn't at work that day, Mary left her phone number and requested that I call her as soon as possible. I thanked Celia for relaying the message, and I ended the call perplexed. I didn't know who Mary was, but out of curiosity, I gave her a call, and Mary ended up being Ryan's estranged wife. I didn't even know he was married. She informed me that Ryan had a nervous breakdown while they were arguing earlier. He started raving like a wild man about how I'm a better girlfriend than she is a wife. He told her that we were in love and that he had been taking care of me and my Down Syndrome son for months. My son doesn't even have Down Syndrome, by the way. My son's not mentally impaired. She initially thought that it was all just crazy talk considering his mental state. He mentioned where I worked, he said we were going to get married, and he said that I had asked him to adopt my son. He said that he was going to run away with me in order to get away from her. He even told her that he started visiting me after following me home one day. And when he said that, Mary knew that something was very wrong. Ryan had somewhat of a history with mental issues, 
and Mary was used to him weaponizing things to hurt her feelings during arguments, even if those things are lies. But she said that this time was different. She knew that he had started frequenting the diner, and red flags went way up for her when he admitted to following someone home. So, she decided to call the diner to see if anyone by my name worked there. When Celia confirmed this, Mary perceived the possible danger, and she left me her name and number requesting a callback. My head was spinning at this point. While things were finally starting to make sense, I was still gobsmacked. And at one point in the conversation, Mary mentioned my grass being mowed. Yes, Ryan even flaunted the yard work that he did for me in her face. It was all very strange and very surreal. Now basically, Ryan has been obsessing over me for months. He became delusional and had created a whole relationship between me and him in his mind. And it was all in his head. And obviously, he was the one that was breaking into my home when I was gone. Why he did it, I still haven't pieced that 100% together. He never took anything, and I imagine he was mowing my grass because that was his little way of taking care of me. Anyway, by the end of the call, I decided to go to the police department in person to file a report about Ryan. I thought that at the very least, this is harassment, and I needed it documented. Maybe I could even get a restraining order. Mary offered to provide an official statement to the police as well to which I thanked her. The PD took our statements, and the harassment complaint was filed. And although I couldn't get a PO based off my statement alone, the officer did assure me that he would personally go talk to Ryan. I then went straight to the diner to inform my boss, Chase, about the situation. Now, Chase took this very seriously. Just that morning, a third shift waitress actually brought up to Chase how a man came to the diner fairly early, at around 4 a.m., and this man was trying to get her to tell him which days I'd be working that week. She told Chase it made her uncomfortable. So when I told Chase about Brian, he went back and looked at the cameras from that morning. And sure enough, the man that was bothering third shift for info about me was Ryan. So Chase initiated the process through corporate to get a permanent ban on Brian from the diner, and it was approved at a later date. I was scheduled to work the following day, and I was nervous throughout my entire shift. But thankfully, Ryan didn't show up, nor did he show up the following day or the next day after that, and all was quiet at my home as well. The officer showing up at Ryan's house to speak with him must have spooked him enough to stop. Weeks, then months went by, and no Ryan in sight. No vandalism at my home, no mysteriously mown grass, nothing. My life had completely gone back to normal. But things changed again in October. October 5th, 2015. It was around 8 p.m., my son Chris fell asleep on the couch while watching a movie, and I had dozed off as well, until I heard a few very light knocks at my front door. I then walked to the kitchen and looked out at the only window that faces my driveway. No cars there except my own, so I figured that the light tapping that I had heard at my door was either just the TV or my half-asleep brain playing tricks on me. I then returned to the couch and started playing a game on my phone. But about five minutes later, I heard a few light knocks on my door again. This time, I was wide awake, so I knew that my brain wasn't playing tricks. So I walked back over to my kitchen window to double-check the driveway to see who was there. Again, my car was the only one in my driveway, and right as I go to close the kitchen window blinds, Loud knocking suddenly erupts at my front door. And I mean loud, angry banging. I guess my instincts kicked in, and I sprinted to the couch. I scooped Chris up into my arms, and I ran down the hallway to his bedroom. I did the only thing that I could think of in that fraction of a moment. 
He was groggy and confused, but he listened to my instructions. I said, Get under your bed and stay under your bed and don't come out until I tell you to. I then ran to my kitchen and grabbed a knife while dialing 911. I actually screamed at the door that I was calling the cops in hopes that it would scare them away. I positioned myself at the end of the hallway, which connects to my son's room to the living room. This way, I'd have a clear view of both the front door and my son's bedroom doorway. As the operator picked up my call, the banging on my front door was getting even louder. 911 said she was dispatching police right away, and she instructed me to stay on the line until they arrived. About 12 minutes into the call, the banging got more violent, rattling pictures off the wall, and I thought for sure that they would break my door down at any moment. 911 asked me where I was located in the home, and I told her. She asked me if I could hide somewhere, and she told me not to put myself in danger. And in that tiny moment, I felt enraged. Hell no, I'm not going to hide. I'm not taking my eyes off my son's bedroom under any circumstance. Where are the cops? And besides, I lived in a small trailer, and the only hiding place for an adult is my bedroom closet, which I'd be easily found. So, I just interrupted over the phone. Look, lady, I'm a single mom. I have no man, no gun, and no place to hide. If he breaks this door down, what am I supposed to do? Throw this knife at him? Where are the effing cops? She assured me again that the cops were on their way and to stay on the line. More banging, but this time, it moved to the actual side of the trailer. It sounded like they were taking a baseball bat and beating against the outside of the trailer. At that moment, Chris started shrieking. I ran a few steps over into his room to check on him. The loud commotion had just pushed his fear gauge over the edge, and he was screaming and crying incessantly under his bed. I quickly ascertained that he was physically okay, and I returned back to the end of the hallway to check on the front door. As I was explaining to 911 that my son was okay, just scared, I noticed that the banging had suddenly stopped. I waited another minute or so, trying to listen out for any sign of further escalation, like maybe a window breaking or something, but all I could hear was sobs coming from my son's room. All in all, it took the cops 23 minutes to arrive, and by then the perp was long gone. For reference, I live about 10 minutes away from the police station and 911 even called it in as an active home invasion, and I was livid about the response time. My front door was made out of some type of metal, just a cheap generic trailer door, but now it was covered in dents. There were noticeable scratch marks on the lock, and the siding of the trailer was damaged where the perp had hit with something. Given the history, I immediately suspected Ryan was the perp, the police said that since I didn't actually see the person, then they couldn't arrest him without an eyewitness. The most that they could do was make a report, and they did end up canvassing the immediate area in case he was on foot. However, there was no sign of him or anyone around and about. I deduced that he probably had parked nearby out of sight, that way, his vehicle wouldn't be spotted or recognized at my home. My home was situated next to a thin patch of woods that has public access roads on the other side. I also am absolutely convinced that Ryan had nefarious plans for me that evening, but when he discovered that my son was at home with me, he bailed. He stopped trying to break into my home that moment that my son made his presence known. For whatever reason, Ryan always lit up when I talked about my son he used to initiate conversations about Chris just to watch me dote over him. And looking back, I guess it was his morbid way of bonding with my child. And I think in his own warped way, he grew to care about him. So when he heard Chris scream, he decided not to follow through with whatever his plan was for me. 
I ended up taking a few days off work because I was so shaken up. I stayed at my parents' house during that time because I was afraid to go home. And my landlord had the damaged store replaced while I was gone. Realizing that I had a job and a life and that I couldn't stay gone forever, I knew that I had to go home. So I got a gun, a small caliber revolver, but it would do the job. And then I went home. I lived in that trailer for another four months before I saved enough money to move. It was totally peaceful during those months, with no further events or altercations. But I just couldn't stand being there anymore. And since then, I had changed jobs, met someone special, got engaged, bought a house, and then got a dog. No further sign of Ryan anywhere during any of these life changes. And it's been nearly seven years since any sign of him. Ryan seems to have disappeared out of my life in the same manner that he first appeared. Out of nowhere. And I couldn't be happier that he's gone. Hopefully, it stays that way. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you can also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember, your fear feeds me.